Controversial portrayals of sensitive subject matter have always been synonymous with cinema since its conception. Whether sex, violence, blasphemy, or taboos, cinema is firmly rooted in the spectacle of dreams. Stories of great train robberies, intense romances, and grandiose encounters with the surreal have normalized the perception of silver screen excess. Further impacted by the dominating paratextual association of early vaudeville exhibition all the way to the contemporary rise of blockbuster franchises. Cinema is interminably suspended in a limbo between low and high art. Some filmmakers strive to create intellectual pieces grappling with philosophical parables, and others are... <laughs> Whether it's the unsimulated eroticism of Tinto Brass, the intense psychedelic nightmares of Gaspar Noé, the abject horror of Julia de Cornell, the visceral bodily exploitation of André Zulowski, or the bleak satire of Ton Salons, Transgressive Cinema has always sought to explore the taboos of status quo in culture and the arts. Though divided by cultural and historical contexts, both Ralph Bakshi and Lars von Trier's respective filmographies challenge dominant ideological values through transgressive screen material and unorthodox aesthetic sense Abilities, with the idiots and heavy traffic exploring identity crisis in social malaise. Appalled by the metastasizing cultural fetishization of technology corroding humanist stories, notorious Danish filmmakers Lars von Trier and Thomas Vinterberg sought to strip back the growing artificiality of cinema to nakedly depict human drama. This birthed the Dogma 95 Manifesto as the resurrection of the human point of view in cinema. Conceived in roughly 30 minutes, the Ten Commandments comprise the vow of chastity, forbidding artificial light, non-diegetic sound, genre conventions, and tripod photography. Though a playful tone, Dogma 95's revolutionary style lent itself to portraying taboo subject matters. Von Trier's The Idiots follows Karen, a middle-aged woman whose desperate encounter with a man she believes to have a learning disability is revealed to be an act, leading to a cult-like intoxication and repulsion with a commune proclaiming to act their inner idiot. While other group members think it's a joke akin to children playing with toys, and others find catharsis in rebelling against the mundanity of the bourgeoisie. The conflicting justifications highlight the crippling midlife crisis as they are later exposed as capitalists, calling into question the actor's sadistic boredom in reaction to self-imposed problems. Despite her clear discomfort, Karen eventually succumbs and becomes a star performer that the group collectively celebrate in an unsimulated orgy. After inviting a small group of people with disabilities into the commune for a party, Stoffer believes that acting is too safe and challenges each member to act the idiot in their bourgeoisie lives. Confronted by their own sadistic escapism, many of the members leave the commune, but Karen accepts, leading her to act in front of her husband and in-laws. The film ends with the once familiar rejecting Karen and she leaves for the fractured commune. The ambiguity of whether Karen found inner peace further complicates Von Trier's message. Similar to the commune's justifications, it's never clear whether Von Trier sympathizes or condemns this behavior. His camera's eye exudes pornographic sensibilities, while the narrative rejects traditional structures of cause and effect in favor of elongated vignettes seemingly celebrating the group's increasing hedonism. <laughs> While predating the contemporary discourse of method acting creating problematic working environments, the film can be read as a metamodernist commentary on the hypocrisies of performance, seeking to discover oneself by embracing abject characteristics of someone culturally perceived as lesser for the sake of art, and how tragically ironic the film predated the offensive portrayals of disabilities in Sia's music, The Theory of Everything, and I Am Sam. However, following a metamodernist interpretation, Von Trier offers freedom in the incorrect. The moral is that you can practice the technique, the dogma technique, or the idiot technique from now to kingdom come without anything coming out of it unless you have a profound passionate desire and the need to do so. Thus the dogma style of degraded image quality, erratic unmotivated jump cuts, reactive compositions, and untreated audio could be argued to be revolutionarily idiotic in the face of perceived high art. An Ouroboros joke that further infects lifestyle is rejecting Lacan's symbolic order to be free, is indulging in taboo a genuine means of discovery one's true self? Is there happiness found in the meaningless of existence? As Julia Christiever expresses, it is thus not a lack of cleanliness or health that causes objection, but what disturbs identity, system, order. Thus, acting the idiot can be perceived as finding peace with the abject. Yet this Camus-esque philosophical suicide is abruptly shattered as the ending's ambiguity denies a clear answer, suspending the film in academic limbo. Is it a cruel endorsement of unapologetic expression or a social satire? We will never know, but 
but similar to the disgust expressed by the commune's family members, perhaps there is resolution found in our collective discomfort. The Guardian described the film as appalling taste. Critic Mark Mode was famously thrown out of the Cannes premiere for heckling, along with many walkouts. And in 2005, Channel 4 aired the uncensored cut only for numerous complaints filed against the network, leading to the UK's broadcasting authority, Ofcom, to officially investigate. Though ruling the film as not in breach of broadcasting conduct, the censored edit was only to be screened in midnight time slots with content warnings. Despite Von Trier and Vinterberg disowning Dogma 95 leading to officially disbanding in 2005, the manifesto's sensibilities have continued to influence their respective works, along with other filmmakers like Harmony Corinne, Richard Kelly, and Michael Winterbottom, while HBO's hit show Succession drew specific inspiration from the celebration. Similarly, Ralph Bakshi's idiosyncratic style has been heavily influential in breaking the stigmas of adult animation and revolutionising animation techniques through his own controversial filmography. Disillusioned by the growing dominance of Disney and Pixar artistically and commercially safe practices, Bakshi sought to carve out his own niche of adult-orientated animation, finding his critical and commercial success in adapting Robert Crumb's Fritz the Cat. Bakshi then made a series of street films inspired by his developing years in Brooklyn. Heavy Traffic, Bakshi's second feature, is a semi-autobiographical portrait of racism, fascism, police brutality, and poverty that surrounds the directionless and disempowered Flaneurs. Bakshi's self-insert aspires for greater purpose in his life and career as an animator, all while wandering from bars to friend groups to sexual escapades to enjoying the small comfort of a local busker. Conversations ramble, greases brutally exert their masculinity, foremans try to crush workers' strikes, wives struggle with unfaithful husbands, and a bar owner just wants to get through the day. Like the idiots, the film resists an easy synopsis, acting as an aggressively political manifesto. There is an artistic fascination with the sociological systems that marginalise and firmly maintain an underclass. However, Bakshi's exaggerative absurdity creates an uncomfortable perversion. It is rare for a scene with a female character to play out without gratuitously unmotivated nudity or objectification in male-centric power fantasies. This has led to a common criticism of Bakshi as a misogynist, along with these repeated depictions of brutalised queer characters, with further criticisms in his fascination with black culture. Like Von Trier, many of the criticisms stem from whether Bakshi appropriated culture for artistic greatness. Whilst most queer cinema focuses on celebrating ostracised sexualities, kinks, and cultures as sex-positive empowerment in reaction to dominant media portrayals of non-heteronormativity as deviant and destructive, intentionally ignorant of their own one-sided power fantasies that abuse and degrade, Bakshi's framing of sex is uniquely uncomfortable. Though Bakshi is certainly sympathetic to the struggles of LGBT communities, with perhaps the most vulnerable moment of the film featuring a transgender sex worker getting ready for work, Bakshi doesn't shy away from the real dominant conservative ideologies and systems that suffocate marginalised people. Women are ritualistically sodomised by brutish men. Those same men mindlessly pursue economic and sexual dominance, with failure in their conquest resulting in meaningless violence. There is an unapologetic hatred of police, depicted as literal pigs in Fritz the Cat and as brutish hypocrites in subsequent street films. A hatred of the mafia, a hatred of bigots, and a hatred of governmental oppression. Yet it is Bakshi's iconoclast animation style that forms his challenging commentary. His neorealist sensibility is chaotically collaged through a hybrid of rotoscoping, stylized street photography, documentary audio, traditional hand-drawn 2D animation, and scripted live action. His art style purposely utilizes offensive stereotypes to exaggerate the realities of abuse, racism, sexism, fascism, and oppression. Bakshi contorts reality into exaggerated absurdity, spotlighting the hypocrisies and horror of the status quo as meaningless. Stereotyping is as much of an object of satire as satirists are the targets. Bakshi's intention was to make all of us laugh at ourselves and our eccentricities. Bakshi saw himself as a part of the cultural melting pot, associating with black communities the identity struggles of Jewish Americans and disenfranchised countercultural movements. This was the reality for Bakshi. Thus, his street films raise a far challenging question. Should films and by extension art provide an accurate representation of reality or an idealized fantasy spectators should strive for? With a further question to whether films should provide a solution for contemporary struggles. Similar to The Idiot's Heavy Traffic ends with a bittersweet acceptance of community, finding internal peace among others while the world seems to burn around them.
Whilst Coonskin received far greater protest, heavy traffic was met with mixed reactions, some praising the film as a difficult satire, whilst others condemned the excess of a seemingly random cartoonish brutality as morbid exploitation. Yet Bakshi's holistic filmography has seen a resurgence with millennials due to its aggressively political satire. Despite differences in historical and geographical context, both Von Trier and Bakshi sought to expose the ugly reality that we escaped through the silver screen. Or perhaps it was all just one cruel joke. Okay, I'm a Nazi. <laughs> <laughs> Completely different note. Um, Peter, Peter, help.